So, uh, so what I'd like to talk about is, uh, is recent work. So this is joint work with, with Adrian Longa. So, uh, and we are generalizing to SL3, uh, the paper, the older paper with Kevin Corlett. About SL2, well, sort of, let's say partially generalizing. Um, and uh, so this, uh, this goes back quite some time. And also, I'd like to say, uh, uh, also thank the organizers. I mean, it's sort of motivated by discussions with, with Bruno and, and maybe Philippe. Uh, among other things. Um, so, so what's the question? So the question is, suppose we have, so x is a compact, a smooth, I'm not sure about Kähler. Let's say smooth projective variety over C. Um, and suppose we have a representation rho from pi 1 of x uh, into SL3 C. And suppose it's rigid. Now, there's a, uh, can, you can make a conjecture which would say that uh, rigid implies motivic. So we'd like to prove, uh, uh, prove the conjecture in this case. Uh, we don't get a proof of the conjecture in this case. But what, what we do get a, is a proof that, uh, so the theorem is that if rho is integral, And rigid, then it is then it's motivic. Uh, let's just say it is of geom geometric origin. Okay. So uh, the point here is that so we don't know how to prove if we just have a rigid representation, we don't know how to prove that it's integral. To prove that it's integral, you would want to have an action on a building or something like that. Maybe there's some possible hope of trying to understand that, but um, uh, I don't know. Uh, okay, so um, what do we do? So uh, we say, so if rho is uh, rigid, Then we can assume, then there exists a number field k such that rho goes from pi 1 of x into SL3. Uh, I, uh, sorry, I should also say, this is the, the technique, as you'll see, is heavily dependent on the fact that this is dimension 3, rank 3. With, with Kevin, we did the case of rank 2. The, you might say, OK, next we'll be doing rank 4 and so on. Maybe there's some possible hope for some type of statement for four, possibly. But I mean, uh, for a higher rank, uh, this method is definitely not going to work. Um, okay. So, uh, so three is kind of the limit. Sorry about that. Uh, anyway. So, so, but if if rho is rigid, then then it has to be defined over a number field, because if there was anything transcendental, that could boot, that could uh, could could move. Okay. So. Uh, and now, what we know is that for any embedding from k into c, including the original one, but any other one, uh, we get a local system v sigma, 
which is also rigid. And by the techniques of harmonic bundles, um, also I'd like to thank Jeremy for the, uh, the previous talk. Um, so by the techniques of harmonic bundles, and notably the, the S1 action and so on, uh, you can just see that uh, it implies that it's a, it's a uh, complex variation of Hodge structure. That actually, that uses Kevin's Colette's theorem, uh, essentially. You don't actually need, you don't need the, the Higgs bundle stuff. You just need to know that you have a pluriharmonic uh, bundle. Okay, so, um, so we have this uh, complex variation of Hodge structure for each V sigma. Now, let's say if we take VK, so VK is the local system VK is the rank three local system of K vector spaces over X. Then uh, VK tensor over Q with C is the direct sum. This is from, this is, I, I think it's due mostly to Deline's paper, Pablo de Chimura, uh, essentially. Uh, If we take the, if we take VK, so it's the rank three local system of K vector spaces, but we think of it as a rank three local, as a rank three times something or other local system of Q vector spaces, then the, and tensor with C, then it's the same as the direct sum over all the embeddings of the V sigma. Okay. And now, these guys are all CVHSs, so we get a structure of Q VHS. By combining the, 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 the complex variation of Hodge structure V sigma, you might have to increase K. For that. So the, the, the Hodge types are just the, the Hodge types of the V sigma. Okay. Now there's some choice because we can shift the Hodge types of the V sigma. Of course, we would want to put them all in the same weight. Uh, we can shift them. But so uh, what can happen? So the Hodge types of the V sigma. So what did you write? You get a, a structure of two variation of a structure by? By combining the V sigma. Well, let's just write it this way. V sigma. Uh, v sigma, the C infinity of V sigma, is the direct sum of V sigma PQ. We can fix it so that P plus Q is always the same weight. Okay. So these are the these are these hot structures, and we just define V. So let's say a, a big round V uh, PQ. Is just the direct sum over the sigmas of V, P, Q, sigma. And we just combine together the, right? And this is the C infinity of the bundle V, K tensor, the local system, V, K tensor, Q, C. Okay. Now, the point here is that this, these guys, so these, these guys are rank three variations of Hodge structure. The possibilities for rank three variations of Hodge structure there's only four possibilities for a rank three variation of Hodge structure, an irreducible rank three variation of Hodge structure. If the Hodge types happens to be separated by a zero, then as some of you might know, uh, the, the, the Kadair-Spencer map has to be zero, so you would get a reducible representation. So if we assume that it's an, so let, let's assume here, for example, Zariski dense. 
I don't want to get in, uh, if, you go, if you're interested in all the little details, you can look at the paper, which is on archive. Uh, but the main peak is in P and Q, so three zero and zero three. Uh, uh, okay, so what, what do I mean by type? What I mean here is that uh, this means uh, V, P, Q, V equals VPQ for one, one VPQ. This is V equals VPQ plus VP prime, let's say P plus one, Q plus one, and this has dimension two and this has dimension one. That's this guy. This guy is V equals VPQ plus VP plus one, Q plus Q minus one, or whatever. Sorry, P, P minus one. Plus one. This has dimension one and dimension two. And the last case is the one we're interested in, is V equals V P Q plus V P minus one Q plus one plus V P minus two Q plus two. They all have dimension one. Okay. So by here, the, by the type, I don't mean the Hodge type. Actually, I mean the the, the partition, which is the 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 dimensions of the guy. Okay. So now remember that we can we can translate stuff. This business of increasing k means that. Uh, these are, these are considered as complex variations of Hodge structure. When we translate stuff, if, if the guy doesn't have a real structure, then we can just sort of add it. Uh, we can increase k by uh, degree two extension, and we can add the complex conjugate. Okay. Uh, can I say, yeah? How do you exclude uh, uh, non-arithmetic lattices in PU21? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> what, what, why? <laughs> well, we'll get to that maybe later. <laughs> I think we're proving, in fact, that uh, so we're proving that if they're, in, they're we're, we're, we prove that if they're integral, then then it's motivic. Our theorem says that if it's in, so, we didn't know too much about applications of that. If you want to tell us, that would be good. Uh, if you know that the traces are algebraic integers, then our theorem says that it's motivic. If you apply this theorem to a yes, 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 so arithmetic, uh, guys, arithmetic portions. Any, no, any. No, 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 no. The, the, the point is that the, we, we, our local system VK, integral means that there's a VOK, an OK module thing, inside VK. Or it means that, it, that I mean, it means that, ro, that, it means that trace of rho of gamma is in OK. So I don't know about I don't know whether this is true for these non-arithmetic lattices. Yes, but it must be true, otherwise your conjecture is true. Yeah, yeah. So conjecturally, it's true, but I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that was our question for Bruno. In fact, but Bruno didn't have Bruno was organizing the conference, so he didn't have time to. <laughs> 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 Sorry. What is the question? Well, Philippe is waking up to the fact that we're claiming that for lattices inside PU two one that uh, if the lattice is integral, yes. then we're claiming that it's motivic. But what do you mean exactly by motivic? Is that you know? Motivic, uh, we'll, we'll see in a minute. I mean, it, it means it comes from a family. It's a direct factor in a, fam in a monodromy of a, f of, a, of a family. But it does not imply that the lattice is dark? No, 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 no. no, no, no. So the question is whether, whether uh, if you apply this theorem to a non which which would lead to a certain one. That's what Bruno did in his paper, in fact, and Invenzione, essentially. No, uh, no, no, no. no. <laughs> as, as you'll see, as you'll see in the case where, the, if the Picard group of X is, is Z, I mean, in Bruno's paper, what happens is the Picard group of X is Z, and the stuff that we're working on here so hard uh, was a fairly easy part of that paper. But the, but the, 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 these other questions are in, discussed in Bruno's paper. Uh, Anyway, so can I continue here? Um, guys, we've got, a, we've got a whole, we've got four pages of birational geometry to do, so let's get going. Um, okay, so the, um, okay, so, so this is just the setup of the whole thing. So the point here is that these, these guys have structures of variation, hard structure of rank three. So the types, are, these are the possible types, okay? Now the point is that if we can rule out If we can rule out the case one, 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 then 
Everybody else, We, somebody uh, yesterday used the terminology effective. If we can rule out the case, this case, then all the, these guys, this guy can put, be put in either 0, 1, or 1, 0. Here we can put 0, 1, 1, 0, and here we have 0, 1, 1, 0. Uh, so if we can rule out that case, then the other pieces can all be put into a weight 1 Hodge structure. And in that case, then, then this big round V is going to be V. 1, 0 plus V, 0, 1. Okay. And it's contain, going to contain the VK, which is a, a Q lattice. If it's integral, that's why we need the hypothesis of integral, then, then it contains the V, OK, which is a Z lattice. And a weight 1. Polarized, uh, by, by variation of hot structure here, I mean always polarized, okay? A weight one polarized a Z VHS corresponds, as is well known by Deline's uh, papers, uh, to a, a family of abelian varieties. So the conclusion is that if we can rule out this 111 case, then the rest of the stuff all fits together, and we can get a family of abelian variety. Uh, I should probably thank uh, uh, Mike Larson, among other people. Uh, I called this Larson's Lemma in, in the paper Higgs Bundles in Local Systems, uh, because Mike told it to me. Um, that's one key step that you need to do this. I mean, to do this, you need to, you need to be a little bit careful about fixing up the polarization and the, the real structure and everything uh, to make this actually work. The, the, we should make, make sure to be able to replace K by a totally imaginary extension of a totally real field. Okay. But that, that's, we can, that's known. So our problem now is just how to rule out the 111 case. And I mean, I've been wondering about this for quite some time. Uh, uh, and so when uh, Adrian Longer was visiting Nice last spring, last spring uh, discussing with him, uh, we realized that actually we could uh, say something about this. Okay. So the sort of the short, the short version of the story is: suppose we have a line bundle. L, then ask longer. OK, that's the short version. <laughs> okay. uh, I mean, he knows how to do stuff, which I just didn't have the famous study of how to do. So uh, among other things, all the stuff which I'm going to now say is due to, to him, basically. Uh, although he, he got very, uh, he bothered me for, uh, for six months about uh, fine details about factorization theorems. Um, which we had, uh, uh, with Philippe and other people, had been discussing for the past 20 years or something like that. So, uh, so there's a kind of, a, in the paper, you'll see a sort of an aspect of lots of discussion of factorization theorems, uh, which is kind of, from my point of view, just going over the folkloric knowledge about factorization theorems. And Adrian wanted everybody, everything to be really <laughs> carefully written out and everything. Uh, so any, any problems in that write-up is my fault. Um, Anyway, but anyway, the, 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 so the main idea here from biorational geometry uh, comes from discussing with, with Adrian what to do when you have a line bundle. Okay, so let's just get started. So we're just, so now I hope uh, I've convinced everybody that we're reduced to this case of a type 111 variation of odd structure. This is the type of guy which is not going to be able to fit into a, an effective weight one thing. Uh, this guy will be able to fit into an, a weight two thing, even if we're not, we're not worried about real structures, but 
uh, complex weight too. So we can just suppose we have a variation of Hodge structure, which is of, of the form a C VHS. So I'll thank you to Jeremy for uh, the talk in which he explained the definition of a CVHS, so I just won't say that. So suppose we have a complex variation of Hodge structure that looks like this with rank one at each place. And that now the, the, the flat connection is decomposes as del plus del bar plus theta plus theta bar. <laughs> Sorry? I previously put in video letters. Ah, uh, sorry. So it is as I expected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> one, one, one. Yeah. So there are three line bundles, okay. Uh, then let's put E, so it's the same bundle, but uh, we'll use an E since it's the Higgs bundle. The, so these, these are C infinity rank one C infinity complex bundles, but they have a complex structure given by the del bar, which is the piece of the connection which just acts here. So these are holomorphic bundles. Holomorphic line bundles, and we have the Higgs field It, uh, otherwise, which was previously known as the Kadair Spencer map. Is theta, which goes from E two zero into E one one tensor omega one X, and it goes from uh, E one one into E zero two tensor omega one X. Okay. Now the first step is to notice that theta Theta wedge theta equals zero. That's one of the conditions, um, which you need to have d be flat, basically. Uh, so if we let's let's define L one to be e uh, two zero tensor e one one dual, and this includes into so uh, as I said, we're, let's assume that this representation is Zariski dense here. So that we're not in a trivial case where like theta equals zero or something. Okay, so this injects into omega one x, and L two is e one one tensor e zero two star. Again, injects into omega one x, and the condition theta wedge theta equals zero. Uh, this I think Fabrizio will find familiar now. <laughs> Uh, this is the Castelnovo type of thing. Um, this tells us that the, the saturated line bundle, that there is a, there's a saturated sub line bundle M in omega one X, which contains both of these images. In other words, at a general point, these two guys are, are the same subbundle. Okay. Otherwise, you wouldn't have theta wedge theta equals zero. So in terms of divisors, we can write uh, L1 of B1 equals M, and it's L2 of B2, where B1 and B2 are effective. Okay. Uh, now, T2, that's probably T2, right? This guy up here. So now we're gonna do our birational geometry here. So the first thing is Bogomolov's lemma. I don't know if Fyodor is here yet, but you can ask him about this later in the week, I guess. Um, Bogomolov's lemma is that M is not big. The other problem with, bio, the, one of the main problems with biorational geometry is that 
these guys use all these words and you don't know what they actually mean. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, so I had to, to press Adrian to explain what they actually mean. But um, so as I understand it, what big means means that, that would mean that h zero of m tensor k uh, looks like some constant times k to the power two, okay, it's a constant, non-zero constant, and it also means, or, or equivalently, that m gives a birational. Map to uh, two dimensional. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, excuse me. Uh, sorry. Uh, let's just assume that X is a surface, okay? Uh, this is just going to make things easier. We can write it down with it, without that, but just to think about things. And also by the left jets theorem and so on. And also, that's not going to mess up our applications to ball quotients either. Um, so, so big in this case for, for we're on a surface now. Okay, means that uh, our one bundle gives you a uh, gives you an embedding. And so, Bogle Mall's lemma says that if we have a sub line bundle M inside omega one x, then it's not big. Basically, you can't have a sort of uh, lots, I mean, you can't have something which might have lots of sections if you tensored it up. Uh, okay. So that's kind of the main thing that we use, actually, plus uh, some other stuff. Um, and now let's just use little letters. So E, P, Q is just the class. I mean, it's the, it's the divisor class of E, P, Q. Et cetera. So we can just use some additive notation here. Um, so we have E two zero plus E one one plus E zero. How are we doing for time? Here? Plus E zero two equals zero. That's just that because we're in a, a SL three representation. Okay. Uh, let's see. So now. Our line bundle L, so L1, this is, remember that corresponds to L1. L1 is E20 minus E11, and L2 is E11 minus E02. Okay. And then we can actually get the form, using this guy and, and these guys, we can just write down the E20 is actually just 2L1 minus L2 divided by 3. E11 is L2 minus L1 divided by 3. You can just check that the sum of these guys equals 0 and that the differences are what you want. Uh, E02. Can you make the definition of the EPQ? The divisor, it's the divisor class of big EPQ. I mean, it's just think of EPQ in the Chow group rather than, in the, rather than as, a, as a sheaf. I mean. okay. Now we're just going to do manipulations, let's say, in the Chow group. Uh, the, so uh, at the end, but this, that's not really important for what I'll be able to say today. At the end, you want to make a difference between the image in the narrow and severi group tensored Q and the actual line bundle. Uh, but actually, you sort of get rid of that by like going to a cover and taking powers of stuff and stuff like that. So let's just say for today, you can just assume that the, these notations are all just the images of everybody in the rational narrow and severi group, roughly speaking. So E02 is minus L1 minus 2L2 divided by 3. Okay, so that's what our guy looks like. Now we can just start calculating here. 3 times M is L1. So, so well, remember we had, uh, where was that? Uh, where's M? M is L1 of V1. Uh, I think it's uh, should be. I think it is. Look at L2, Minus L2. Ah, uh, sorry, this is plus, excuse me. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, yeah. Okay, let's see. So, um, 
it has to be sort of symmetric. And, and uh, I mean, at some place, you have to realize the situation, that, I mean, these guys are not symmetric because we're not assuming it's an R variation of our structure. So they're not, L1 and L2 are not the same, but they play the same rule. If you take the dual, then they interchange. So uh, you can use one or the other. Uh, let's see, so M, so we have M equals L1 plus B1, and that's equal to L2 plus B2 in the small letter notation. So 3M is equal to L1 plus B1 plus 2 times L2 plus B2, which is equal to 3 times L1 plus 2 times L2. L1 plus 2 times L2 is minus E02 plus B1 plus 2B2. So remember, these guys are effective, OK? So this guy is greater than or equal to minus 3E02. By where greater than or equal to means the difference is effective. That's another one of these notations where the birational geometry people throw around greater than or equal to. It actually means something precise, OK? Uh, which might not be clear at some, sometimes, in some cases. Uh, so we get, we get m greater than or equal to minus e02. And similarly, m greater than or equal to e20. Uh, next step is that the Higgs bundle E with the Higgs field theta is stable is stable as a Higgs bundle. That's kind of a it's sort of a Lubka's theorem for Higgs bundles. Um, what does that mean? That means that the sub, so the sub bundle, what's the sub bundle here? The sub bundle, the, the theta goes in that direction. So the sub bundle would be, say, E02. So degree E02 dot A is strictly less than zero. So, uh, sorry, I should also say A is an ample hyperplane. A is an ample class. So E02 dot A is strictly negative, and E20 dot A is positive. Okay. Now, the first, first claim is that E20 squared is less than or equal to 0. Proof? If not, then we get E20 squared is, let, is greater than zero. Uh, so remember, we're on a surface. So if I take the square, that's just a number, OK? So in the case of uh, the square, this doesn't mean something about difference effective. That's just a number, OK? Uh, but we also have e, e20 dot a is also po strictly positive. Now, remember, E20 is a line bundle. If we have a line bundle with strictly positive degree and whose square is positive, that implies that it's big. Uh, why is it big? It's because if we look at the formula for the Euler characteristic of the kth tensor power of the line bundle, it has a term which is the square times k squared times the square. And that's bigger than everybody else. The only thing you might worry about is, OK, maybe that's the Euler characteristic, but maybe there's lots of elements of H2. But by stair duality, the H2 is the H0 of the dual. And since it has strictly positive degree, the dual is going to be more and more negative. So eventually, that would have to be 0. Okay? So that means it's big. Okay, But we know that m was bigger than or equal to, meaning that the difference is effective, bigger than or equal to e20. And m is not big. But if we take a big line bundle and we add an effective guy, then it's still big because there's still lots of sections. Okay. So this is a contradiction. So 
So e two zero squared less than or equal to zero. This is the type of thing which I learned from 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 long ago. I mean, uh, for some people it's like second nature, I suppose. But um, let's see. So similarly, uh, e zero two squared less than or equal to zero. Then it just sort of goes on like that for pages and pages, you might say. Um, <laughs> but we still have some time. Uh, not, no, it's actually, this is, we're getting closer here. Uh, we still haven't used another important factor in the whole thing. So remember that, uh, I'll, I'll say a sort of a more theoretical thing for the, for the Higgs bundles fans among you. Uh, remember that for a stable Higgs bundle, we have the Bogomolov Giesecker inequality that says, C2 greater than or equal to zero, I mean, CH2 greater than or equal to zero. Since the determinant is, zero, is trivial, it's just the same as saying C2 greater than or equal to zero. So you expect the, the condition C2 equal to zero to actually give a sort of a strong constraint. So uh, here, since we're in, in the case of a flat bundle, the C2 equals zero. But the point is we expect that to give a strong constraint. So we need to use that fact somewhere. So use. C2 of E equals zero. I won't give you the calculation here, uh, but it just says uh, minus E20, I just copied this from our paper, squared plus E11 dot E02 equals zero. I hope that's correct. Uh, so it says that. Uh, E two zero <laughs> squared equals E one one dot E zero two. I mean, there's there's obviously several different versions of that formula because because we have this relation. Okay. So you're using C two plus the model of the inequality. But no, we're not using the Bogomolov inequality because I mean, here we're in the case of equality of the Bogomolov inequality. I'm just saying that because of the Bogomolov inequality. You sort of expect that in the case of equality, you would have a uh, you would have some interesting information. I guess maybe I should say that one also has. I'm not sure where we use that actually. I should maybe check. But one also has the Bogomolov inequality for rank one Higgs bundles, and we have a bunch of sorry for rank two Higgs bundles. We have a bunch of rank two Higgs bundles if we take e20, e11, but not the other one, or, or e11, e02. Um, <coughs> I forget where that comes in. Uh, anyway, maybe it gives an alternate proof of some, something. Uh, anyway, so now let's just calculate L2 squared is E11 minus E02 squared, which is E11 plus E02 squared minus four E11 one one E02, because <coughs> there was a plus two minus four. But this is this guy, <coughs> by the relation, is the same as minus E20 uh, squared. So we got uh, E20, the minus doesn't have, doesn't enter in because we have a squared. Uh, e20 squared minus 4. <coughs> and E11, E02 was equal to E20 squared, which is minus 3 E20 squared. Okay. Uh, E20 squared was less than or equal to 0, so minus 3 of that is greater than or equal to 0. So L2 squared is greater than or equal to zero. And similarly, L1 squared is greater than or equal to zero. <coughs> now, lemma, if L squared greater than or equal to zero, L dot A strictly positive, and L not big, then L is an F, and L squared equals zero. 
good. So here's here's again I can again complain about these birational geometry people. Um, so but but once you've got one under the under your under your uh, questioning, then you can ask them questions such as why is that called NEF? Because it doesn't look like numerically effective to me. So the point is NEF does not mean numerically effective. NEF, according to, uh, was invented by Miles Reed to be numerically eventually free, or essentially free. Okay. So when you look at NEF, so the thing to remember is when you look at NEF, don't think numerically effective. Okay. It has nothing to do with numerically effective. Okay. Uh, we don't actually know, need to know what NEF is. Uh, we just apply various statements about it. Um, uh, no, sorry, no, 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 excuse me, I thought what you do. No, NEF, L NEF, means that L dot C is positive for all effective C. No, 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 no. It's dual to effective, right? Because suppose we have a, an exceptional curve then a, the, an exceptional curve dot itself is negative, right? So uh, it's an effective guy, but which is not at all NEF, okay? Uh, NEF, so, but th this, is, this is something that looks like what would happen if you had a, a divisor which ran in a free, in a movable linear system. Okay, so it's something which numerically looks like it might be movable, okay? And that's why eventually free or essentially free or something like that. Okay, let's see, where are we? Okay, so now by stability of the Higgs bundle, one of these two line bundles, Li, has to be strictly positive. One should be careful that not to say both have to be strictly positive. That's actually not true. As one can show examples on a curve where they're not both, where one of them could be negative. Okay? But one of these two guys has to be strictly positive, otherwise, just for example, uh, I mean, you can just see. Uh, I mean, from, from this guy, well, let's say from this guy, this guy has to be positive, right? So one of these two guys has to be positive. So let's uh, suppose it's a, so assume it's, a, it's L1. Here's where what I said about being able to take the dual and interchange the two comes in. We can assume it's one or the other, it's the same. I'm hoping to get to a stage where at least some people might say, okay, that looks like it should open. Lemma. Yeah. Sorry? I don't understand the lemma. Why is the lemma? I mean, if it's not big, L squared is zero, okay? And then you take the, the decomposition, the relative decomposition, and why you don't have a negative part? Well, for a left line bundle, L squared bigger than zero is equivalent to big. I don't know if you have a line bundle. That's the right. you know that's it's what it claims that is net. Oh, you know it is net. Oh, that's a quick thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. These, these three, these conditions here imply that L is nef and L squared equals zero. That's the claim. Uh, why? The question is why. Why? I'm sorry. You'll have to look at the paper for the. Uh, that's uh, <laughs> something about Zariski semi decomposition, but let's discuss that afterwards, okay? Uh, <laughs> Let's put it this way, if those kind of lemmas aren't true, then we have to modif seriously modify our claims here. Um, okay, so stability. Uh, so let's assume we have L1 dot A strictly positive. So then, uh, Ah, but let's, uh, let's point out that neither the L1 and L2, Li are not big. Because M was Li plus an effective guy, so M is not big, so Li is not big, okay? So this, this statement applies to whichever one has a positive degree, or to both, if both have a positive degree. Okay, so, so we get L1 squared, we get L1 is nef and L1 squared equals zero. Now our strategy is just kind of to go along and prove that everybody equals zero, basically. Uh, let's see here. 
Ah, so the next point is that uh, E theta is L1 semi-stable. So from now on, uh, we've chosen that L1 is the guy which is positive. So L1, now we know L1 is nef and L1 squared equals zero. Uh, something which is nef, another sort of characterization, is it something which is a limit of, af of ample guys. Okay. If we have a Higgs bundle, if the Higgs bundle according to, corresponding to a flat bundle is semi-stable for any polarization, and semi-stable is sort of closed condition with less than or equal to, then in the limit, it's also semi-stable. So, for example, E1, let's see, uh, which one was it? L1, uh, let's see, E1 dot, say, uh, minus E0, 2 dot L1 is greater than or equal to zero. Uh, and this is, uh, L1 plus 2L2, either one will actually work, dot L1 greater than or equal to zero. But L1 dot L1 is equal to zero. So this says L2 dot L1 equals zero, uh, greater than or equal to zero, sorry. Mm -hmm. Also, the BI are effective. So L1 dot B1 is greater than or equal to zero, and L1 dot B2 greater than or equal to zero. Okay. So we get, since L1, so we get L1 dot M greater than or equal to zero, because M was B2 plus L2. Okay. Now we use the next lemma which Adrian calls Zariski semi-decomposition. Which says that if C equals L plus B with L nef, B effective, C not big, C is gonna be our M here not big, then L1, and then L squared equals zero. We already knew that. L dot B equals zero, and B is semi-negative. Okay. Now the conclusion of that guy, uh, like two at once. <laughs> so the conclusion of that guy is, well, let's apply that to L1 plus B1. What do you mean B1? Well, it means that like the, 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 the matrix where you make the intersection of the different components of B is like negative semi-definite or something like that. At least B, B squared is less than or equal to zero in any case. plus some other statement. Okay. But in fact, I mean, B intersected with kind of any uh, one of its components is gonna be negative too. So the conclusion here, so apply to M equals L1 plus B1, so this says that L1 dot B1 equals zero. We already knew that L, I mean, we, the L squared equals zero part we already knew. Uh, so L1 dot M equals zero. But now L1 dot M is equal to L1 dot L2 plus B2. But we know that L1 dot L2 plus L1 dot B2. M is not, we don't know that M is effective. But we know that M is not big. We're applying this to, to M equals L1 plus B1. B1 is effective, L1 is. You don't need this effective. We're not, not yet. Uh, we're, we're, we're getting there. Sorry? 
Uh, not according to Adrian. <laughs> uh, again, uh, <laughs> but it's. I mean, C is going to be. Well, C is nef plus a vector well, anyway. Uh, let's just continue here. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, it's effective plus nef, basically. Okay. Um, nef is something which is a limit of effective guys because it's a limit of, uh, of ample guys. But, but now we already know that this guy is greater than or equal to zero, and we know that this guy is greater than or equal to zero. This sort of comes from the C2 calculation. This comes from the fact that L1 is nef and B2 is, is effective. So both terms are greater than or equal to zero, but this is zero. So both terms have to be equal zero. Then we're, we've almost got everybody equal zero, basically. Ah, uh, also, C2 equals zero. Maybe I won't do just this calculation. You can just imagine. Oh, C2, C2 is uh, basically some like one third maybe of L1 squared plus L1 L2 plus L2 squared. Okay. And we know that this is equal to zero. But on the other hand, uh, the other two terms are zero, so, so L2 squared equals zero also. Okay. Now let's choose uh, since L1 dot A is, is strictly positive, we can choose a, a rational number a, little a, such that L1 minus little a times L2, ah, uh, sorry, uh, this should maybe be little a times L1 minus L2. Uh, we can choose a rational number little a, such that a times L1 minus L2 uh, dot the ample class equals zero. But this guy squared equals zero, because now we've proved that all, this, all the different terms are zero. So we have a, a divisor which, whose square equals zero and whose degree is zero. And by the Hodge index theorem, it's zero. So that's true in the rational narrow and severity. So A times L1 equals L2 in the narrow, let's say, equal to L2 in the narrow and severity group tensor Q. Okay. So now we're sort of getting closer to what we're trying to show here. So now we've got the L1 and L2 are basically the same line bundle, except up to some torsion phenomena. Uh, so in fact, we've got all products are zero, except maybe uh, b1 dot b2. So to remedy this b1 dot b2 thing, what we can do is we can write b1 equals b1 prime plus b, and b2 equals b2 prime plus b, where b is the common component. So b1 prime and b2 prime have no components in common. And m prime is m of minus b, which is l1 of b plus b prime, b1 prime, which is l2 plus b2 prime. And let's, let's just not do the calculation, but we can just see in that case that uh, the b i prime dot the l j b i prime dot b j prime. Everybody, all the intersections are zero. Okay. Now let me just say what sort of, uh, so we're done at, at the end of the time. But, so I hope I've at least convinced maybe Bruno and Philippe that this is starting to look like we have a control over the situation at a sort of minimum. Um, so, now let me, so let me just explain what's supposed to happen here. So the part of the problem is that this, this, uh, this number A is not necessarily positive. You'd think it would be positive. It could actually be negative. But the point is, if it's negative, then it actually has to come from a curve. The example where it's negative is on a curve. And in fact, the example where A is different from 1 comes from a curve. 
And in fact, we can say more. So we can say that uh, either uh, b1 prime equals b2 prime equals 0. In that case, uh, l1 equals l2 equals m prime. It's the same subbundle of omega 1x. And you can see in that case that the what some of you might be expect, sort of suspecting here, which is that our rank 3 uh, variation of Hodge structure is actually a symmetric square of a rank 2 variation of Hodge structure. Up to maybe tensoring by a 3 torsion rank 1 piece. Okay. But this contradicts our zero ski dense. Hypothesis, and in the in more generally in the proof about being motivic, then it reduces us to the case of SL two. So it, so it comes from we have the symmetric square and gives a map of groups from SL two into SL three. It means the monodromy is in SL two basically. So either we have that guy, or we prove factorization through a curve. Uh, at the beginning, I left that up, so uh, I guess I erased it. Uh, it was on this board here. Uh, the point is, if it's not zero ski dense, then we're in a smaller group, and, and because of the paper with Corlett, we have already treated the case of SL2. Okay. Or, I mean, you, you, we, we tried to make a, a zillion different possible statements, some of which you don't assume zero ski dense, but then one of the conclusions is that we. One case, possi one possible case is the symmetric square. The other case is prove that that v factors through a curve. Okay. Um, we can uh, let me just finish here, but we can sort of vaguely see wh why that might factor through a curve. I mean. Um, The point is, uh, let's see, uh, sorry, I wanted to say what the point was. Uh, ah, right. The point is that if B2 is different from 0, say B, one of the, say B2 prime different from 0, but this is effective. And it's proportional to, to M prime in the Naren Severi group. So this is what Fabrizio was saying that M prime becomes effective. Uh, roughly speaking. So we get a, something which is more or less effective up to having to go to some, some covers and so on. And uh, uh, so, so we get a, a alpha in H0 of M prime, which is an H0 of omega 1x. And let me just, for the experts, sort of say how you could sort of finish the proof from here, which is, so now we have a one form, and the one form defines the line bundle, which uh, is the direction of the theta guy. So on the, full, on the leaves of the foliation defined by the one form alpha, theta vanishes. So it means that our original variation of Hodge structure actually splits into a direct sum of line bundles, unitary line bundles, along the leaves of the foliation. Now, a quick and dirty way of sort of more or less finishing from here is to apply my Lefschetz theorem for integral leaves of holomorphic one forms. Either the one form factors through a curve, or else the pi ones of the leaves are basically the, at least the commutator subgroup uh, of the pi one of the, the variety. But, if, but you can't have our variation of Hodge structure splitting along a normal subgroup of pi one, basically. So that's sort of quickly the, the end of the proof. But anyway, I, I mean, I'm so, sorry, the, the takes a little bit longer. But um, I hope I've convinced you that at least you can sort of, by doing this birational geometry stuff, you really have to know what's going on here, OK, which more than I did last year in any case. Um, but by doing this type of argument, uh, it's kind of miraculous that you can sort of uh, little by little get, get more information about our, these line bundles and come to the conclusion that you start, you start, they start looking like stuff that, that you know about, basically. OK, so I'll stop. Is there any questions that have been asked?
we'll hand the microphone to the person who asked the question. So <laughs> please don't be intimidated. I mean, you know, this, I, I can <laughs> The fact that it's Sarinsky dance, uh, otherwise is SL2 follows from rigidity, that you cannot have some unipotent uh, part would be well, contradicting no, rigidity. I mean, you could have SL2 and then something here, and then... But it's a variation of hot structure, so the monodromy group is reductive. So it might be like the normalizer of a torus, for example, or something like that, but... Uh, Why do you have a... Uh, okay. It's a variation of hot structure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's uh, because of, because of rigidity. Yeah, yeah because yeah. of rigidity, it's because variation of hot structure. Because of rigidity. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I mean, you said something about uh, rank four. Well, so what's going to be the problem for rank four? Um, I mean, for one thing, Adrian looked at the case one, 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 and didn't see how to proceed even there. But of course, for rank four, you might have like two, one, one. So you might have uh, wait two. Hodge structure with Hodge numbers two one one, mm. and then uh, I mean you still sort of have a line bundle because the the guy from the two to the one the it factors through a line bundle and so on. So I mean, you might be able to try to discuss in that case in some way, but so I mean you might. Uh, let me understand. So you say one 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 one, you exclude in the similar. No no way. no, we haven't we haven't no. excluded one 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 either. Uh, no. There's some discussion in the preprint you can look at, but uh, even in that case we didn't. Get. I mean, you could sort of hope that this type of argument might possibly give you some information in that case, but once you start going to, that's why I said rank four might be possibly some possibility, but rank five, you'll have a case of two, two, one, for example, and the two, two guy, you have a map of vector bundles, so. Uh, <laughs>